The love of God is the source of all truth. People with a distorted image of self, world, or God will be largely incapable of experiencing what is really real in the world. They will see things through a narrow keyhole. They'll see instead what they need reality to be, what they're afraid it is, or what they're angry about. They'll see everything through their aggressiveness, their fear, or their agenda. In other words, they won't see it at all. That's the opposite of contemplatives, who see what it is, whether it's favorable or not, whether it meets their needs or not, whether they like it or not, and whether or not that reality causes weeping or rejoicing. Most of us will usually misinterpret our experience until we've been moved out of the false center. Until then, there is too much of self in the way. We need support in unmasking our false self and in distancing ourselves from our illusions. For this, it is necessary to install a kind of inner observer, a fair witness. At first, that sounds impossible, but with patience and practice, it can be done and even becomes quite natural. I attended a lecture once by one of the top wine tasting experts in the world. And he had achieved this certification because he had been presented with dozens and dozens and dozens of wines that he was able to correctly identify in terms of the grapes that were in the wine and what region of the world it was from and the year that it had been produced. And he talked about how he did that. And he, when he got a glass of wine, he would, of course, check out the, the bouquet, the uh, aromas, and he'd look at the clarity and the, the density and the color. And then he would, he would taste the wine, but he would taste it to determine the minerals that were in the soil that showed up eventually in the grape, and then he'd assess not only the, the soil content, but likewise the weather conditions for the particular year that created the amount of juice that was in the grape. If it was a wet year, and if it was particularly dry, then the kind of concentration. And likewise, the sugar content of the berry at the, when it was picked and harvest. And all that was going on. And, he, that's why he was the best in the world. But nonetheless, he said the one question he never asked, and if he did ask it, he only asked it much later, was, do I like it? Do I like it? As we venture out into this reality stuff, the temptation is going to be to say, do I like it? The question is not. Do I like it? Do I want it? Do I hope it's going to be this way? The question is not, do I agree with it? The question is not, do I believe this? Do I not believe this? The question is finally, is this the way life is? Is this the way life is? As I experience my experience of living my actual daily life. Is this the way life is? Our creation is by love, in love, and for love. It is both our birthright and our authentic destiny to participate fully in this creative loving. And freedom of will is essential for our participation to occur. But our freedom is not complete. Working against it is the powerful force of addiction. Psychologically, addiction uses up desire. It is like a psychic malignancy, sucking our life energy into specific obsessions and compulsions, leaving less and less energy available for other people and other pursuits. Addiction is a deep-seated form of idolatry. The objects of our addictions become our false gods. These are what we worship, 
what we attend to, where we give our time and energy instead of love. Addiction then displaces and supplants God's love as a source and object of our deepest true desire. The significance of addiction is not just that we lose freedom through attachment to things, nor even that things so easily become our ultimate concerns. Of much more importance is that we try to fulfill our longing for God through objects of attachment. God wants to be our perfect lover, but instead we seek perfection in human relationships and are disappointed when our lovers cannot love us perfectly. God wants to provide our ultimate security, but we seek our safety and power and possessions, and then we find we must continually worry about them. We seek satisfaction of our deep longing in a host of ways that may have very little to do with God, and sooner or later, we are disappointed. I sort of like my attachments. I am not certain I want a real and authentic relationship with the way life is. I don't mind giving up a little freedom if I feel good, even if the feeling doesn't last. The relationship to life you describe is common. We seem to love consorting with substitutes for reality. But as always, reality will have the final word, even if, for the moment, we believe we are getting our way. What do you mean? Why don't we have Nikos Kazantzakis address this question? See if any of this resonates. We are living in a critical, violent moment of history. An entire world is crashing down. Another has not yet been born. Our epoch is not a moment of equilibrium in which refinement, reconciliation, peace, and love might be fruitful virtues. We live in a moment of dread assault. We stride over our lagging friends. We are imperiled in the midst of chaos. We drown. We can no longer fit into old virtues and hopes, into old theories and actions. The wind of devastation is blowing. This is the breath of our God today. Let us be carried away in its tide. The wind of devastation is the first dancing surge of the creative rotation. It blows over every head and every city. It knocks down houses and ideas. It passes over desolate wastes and shouts, prepare yourselves, war, it's war. This is our epoch, good or bad, beautiful or ugly, rich or poor. We did not choose it. This is our epoch, the air we breathe, the mud given us, the bread, the fire, the spirit. Let us accept necessity courageously. It is our lot to have fallen on fighting times. Let us tighten our belts. Let us arm our hearts, our minds, and our bodies. War is the lawful sovereign of our age. Today, the only complete and virtuous person is the warrior. For only this one is faithful to the great pulse of our time, smashing, hating, desiring, follows the present command of our God. This identification of ourselves with the universe begets the two superior virtues of our ethics, responsibility and sacrifice. It is our duty to help liberate that God who is stifling in us, in humankind, the masses of people living in darkness. God is never created out of happiness or comfort or glory, but out of shame and hunger and tears. At every moment of crises, an array of humanity risk their lives in the front ranks as the standard bearers of God to fight and take upon themselves the whole responsibility of the battle. Once long ago, it was the priests, the kings, the noblemen, or the burghers who created civilizations and set the infinite transparency free. Today, God is the common worker made savage by toil and rage and hunger. She stinks of smoke and wine and meat. She swears and hungers and begets children. She cannot sleep, 
She shouts and threatens in the cellars and garrets of earth. The air has changed, and we breathe in deeply a spring laden and filled with seed. Cries rise up on every side. Who shouts? It is we who shout, the living, the dead, and the unborn. But at once we're crushed by fear, and we fall silent. And then we forget, out of laziness, out of cowardice. But suddenly, the cry tears at our entrails once more, like an eagle. For the cry is not outside us. It does not come from a great distance that we may escape it. It sits in the center of our hearts and cries out. God shouts, burn your houses. I am coming. Whoever has a house cannot receive me. Burn your ideas. Smash your thoughts. Whoever has found the solution cannot find me. I love the hungry, the restless, the vagabonds. They are the ones who brood eternally on hunger, on rebellion, on the endless road, on me. I am coming. Leave your wives, your children, your ideas, and follow me. I am the great vagabond. Follow. Stride over joy and sorrow, over peace and justice and virtue. Forward. Smash these idols. Smash them all. They cannot contain me. Smash even yourself that I may pass. Set fire. This is our great duty today amid such immoral and hopeless chaos. War against the unbelievers. The unbelievers are the satisfied, the satiated, the sterile. Our hate is uncompromising because it knows that it works for love better and more profoundly than any weak-hearted kindness. We hate. We are never content. We are unjust. We are cruel and filled with restlessness and faith. We seek the impossible like lovers. So fire to purify the earth. Let a more dreadful abyss open up between good and evil. Let injustice increase. Let hunger descend to thresh our bowels, for we may not otherwise be saved. Now, this is really over the edge. You have to be crazy. This is absolutely nuts. Is it nuts? As offensive and radical as this poetic statement is, for me, it captures some of the reality I experience today. Loving the ultimate as that which we take most personally changes everything. Don't stop here. Personally loving reality as one's ultimate concern is worth the journey into authenticity. Let's continue.